so. It's now quarter past one. And do you hear what I'm saying, Christine? Yeah, that's very clear. <laughs> Thank you. That's very good. So maybe I think the rest of the attendees can hear something as well. So welcome to this uh, fourth and final uh, lecture in, within the series of the Sound Studies Lecture Series, what we call, and this is, I'm here at the Sound Environment Center at Lund University in Sweden. My name is Senna Kroh-Kroh, and I'm the director of the center. And I'm also an associate professor in uh, musicology here in Lund. Um, I would like to address before starting that uh, the lecture will be recorded, but the discussion afterwards will not be recorded. And you can see later see this lecture along with uh, the other three and with the seminars that we have organized in the Sound Environment Center at our YouTube channel. So this is a little commercial I just did for that. But please go in and, and see them if you haven't attended the previous lectures. So now I would like to welcome today's speaker, Christine Gilbo. Uh, and I first met Christine in, at a noise conference in Madrid, I think two and a half years ago, just before the year before Corona. <laughs> And I was very fascinated about her profile and her research because she combines social anthropology with ethnomusicology, which is um, a field I personally also work within. But and I think it was really interesting how to hear more about uh, what where what direction this combination is taking her. So today, Christine will be speaking about listening approaches in her work. Uh, and I think, among other places, we'll visit a noisy bus station in India. The work she will present is, I don't know if all of it is, but part of it is published in this anthology from 2017, which I can highly recommend. Uh, she's also the co-editor of another anthology called Worship Sound Spaces, Architecture, Acoustics and Anthropology that came out in 2020. So. Uh, please, Christine, the floor is yours. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Sani Groot and for this invitation and the Sound Environment Center of Lund University as well. That's a great pleasure to, to present this uh, paper. Um, so, this presentation um, deals with um, two examples uh, of public spaces in India as it is invested with a specific uh, sound effects. Uh, I will examine two, uh, the first example uh, of uh, a bus station in South India and its local management of crowd. And the second example uh, deals with the perception of what is called the, a quiet area such as parks and other natural areas in, in the city. So first of all, I would like to start this uh, paper with a short introduction regarding the study of sound environments. Um, a wide uh, variety of approaches of the audible world have emerged during the last decades. Um, a whole field of research, of course, and practice is springing up with own publications, experiments, and journals, a field uh, which uh, set us to lend an ear to everyday situations and learn to listen to our ways of being together. Among this field, we may also to distinguish very different way to identify sound. These all three terms are closed, referring to a sonic experience, and are sometimes associated. In soundscape, a term coined by uh, Robert Murray Schaeffer, the idea of the composition of the sonic environment is uppermost, with the possibility of an aesthetic way of listening to the everyday world. With auditory environment, it's more a case of immersion that a frontal relationship of a listening to music posture. Sound being a part of our surrounding, it is in our in situ experience. <coughs> Through the concept of ambient sound, it seemed to attach just as much importance to sonic actions as their perceptual counterpart. That means the social modalities of producing the sonic environment 
Aedus of his reception. In other words, and quoting the sociologist Jean-Paul Thibault, I quote, ambient sound above all concern, the pervasive noises of living in society and forms of social life in so far as they may be heard and make themselves audible to other, end of quote. Conceptually, uh, one may mention the chart of opposition suggested by the French psychologist Daniel Dubois in 2012. She discusses, it was nearly nine years ago, <coughs> ten, more than 10 years ago, sorry. She discusses the variation in the conceptualization of the soundscape notion, as well the methodological consequences in tales in investigating the perceptual aspect of meanings and meanings of sound environments related to the concept of ambience. Of course, my anthropological research is of course more related with the right side of the chart among studies focused on the percept perceptual qualities of sound milieu. Uh, this research policy entails observing everyday practices form as closely as possible. It concentrates on ordinary sense of life and interaction observed at the scale of particular places, such as a street, a neighborhood, a station. It also proposes pay closer attention to phenomena and consider the wide range of sounds even, including voices, footsteps, firecrackers, bells, bird song, and so on, sometimes compounding each other and sometimes layer on two other sounds. Um, I have um, carried out my fieldwork uh, in India, but when confronted with the topic of the quality of the, of the acoustic environment in uh, global cells, societies around the world tend to consider sound mainly in its negative phase of noise or annoyance. This approach is reflected in numerous recommendations and prescriptions to reduce people's exposure to excessive sound levels and promoted by international institutions such as WHO or European Union. In this conception of pollution, uh, there is um, a perspective of public health, of course, and the improvement of citizens' quality of life but it does raise a few issues in an anthropological undertaking such as ours. Um, ambient sound is produced and altered by, by a wide range of material and surfaces, whether conditions and media upon which its propagation depends, such as air and temperature, temperature, temperature sorry. However, by nature, it is also immaterial and part of daily sensory experience. We should account for this inherent complexity by analyzing it as a composite material. Uh, the ethnographic approach is primarily devoted to understanding the sensory modalities of production of sound environment, decrypting the range of local knowledge and the imaginaries that they inspire in a given group or society. Um, here is some uh, uh, photograph issued of uh, our project Milson, uh, Anthropology of Sound Milieu, uh, that I lead in Paris uh, for the last uh, 10 years. Um, we have um, uh, published this book that has been already introduced by Sana uh, in Routledge, and another one uh, specifically specifically dedicating to the perception of places of worship all over the world and co-edited with an acoustician, Catherine uh, Lavandier. And we are also investigating the, art the artistic field uh, by sound creation with a collaboration with uh, RFI, International France Radio that is broadcast uh, all over the world. And uh, we got a collaboration uh, for the last five years to publish sound creation based on our um, sound samples collected on the field work, during field work. So this is also an important part of uh, the project. Uh, one uh, starting point uh, of the research is to develop analysis 
of uh, the cultural dimension of listenings. There are classical debates uh, in social sciences to define what is listening. From a theoretical perspective, uh, several authors have described a model how to listen in great details. Um, I have reported some of them, but mostly uh, credit is due to sound creation. And for instance, uh, Pierre Schaeffer, uh, the French uh, scholar and artist Pierre Schaeffer during the 60s, and in ethnomusicology too with uh, Bernard Lotta Jacob, uh, for having particularly well explored the cultural listening firing pragmatic and performative descriptors. Uh, however, the mundane listening, I mean the ordinary sounds collected in public spaces have not received much attention from anthropology to date. Uh, another way to understand such a listening is investigating lexical fields associated with the notion of ambience or milieu in various languages such as atmosphere in French, ambiente in Spanish, ambiance in English, and so on. Um, in English, for instance, uh, what I perceive asserts a distinction between the object of perception and the perceiving subject, a relationship that proves irrelevant in certain languages. In Indian languages, for instance, the passive construction is preferred to the active one the sound is not perceived, it is made audible to others. A social relationship is defined through the linguistic construction. The study of lexical fields is important as well. Whereas English identifies sound, noise, and silent in three distinct terms, other languages express this notion by using prepositions, shabda, nishabda in Sanskrit, for instance, and with other semantic fields, for instance, to express emotion through sound that is embedded in the lexical fields. So there is a, um, a very important project to collect this, uh, this uh, lexical field and to analyze this uh, um, associated with the field work. <laughs> Um, in continuity, uh, one, especially, one point especially is relevant, um, must be emphasized, uh, is to consider the great diversity of cities and city life, uh, be they national capitals, uh, urban and cultural centers, or even smaller cities. In India, uh, with their unclear boundaries, the city are often perceived as places where the observer can quickly become disoriented. The limits between the public and private activities are often difficult to discern. The boundaries between street and sidewalk are porous. Uh, the circulation is dense, both on the roads and in the crowds. And the constant stream of the most uh, heterogeneous daily activities. Um, and of course, uh, the perception um, of sound is changing according to the social actors. Here is a, a, a photograph from the Sarai program uh, conducted in India about uh, slums. <coughs> um, a very strong opposition uh, is emphasized in the work of sound perception in sounds. Uh, for instance, Tripta Chandola, um, an anthropologist has analyzed how people living in the slum perceive silence and calm in public garden as a lack of social network. Uh, moreover, the perception of sound traffic is different. They consider the daily traffic noise as the social domination of the middle classes. So sound representation is embedded in uh, social orders too. That is uh, important to, uh, um, to, to describe and analyze. Okay, so that was the part of my long introduction. Um, so now um, I will uh, examine the first example uh, dealing with uh, the management of the crowd in a bus stand in India. Um, the bus station is a space for mobility and circulation. Travelers find themselves immediately thrust into a very deep 
sound environment. Uh, this density attracted me to, and invited me to, to study this uh, space environment. The multiple events occurring at the same time give the impression of a vast sonic chaos. Following the stream of the passenger that we can see here, uh, a central platform can be seen along with several dozen buses as parked awaiting their departure. Uh, the video I'm going to play that was also uh, associated with uh, the book um, is made of different shots. Um, I have filmed uh, different areas of the platform within the stream of pedestrian uh, moving or among a group standing or sometimes focusing on interaction uh, and sometimes focusing on uh, ticket vendors stationed at the back of the vehicles. So we shall actually play a few seconds of this video and I will comment it afterwards. The first impression uh, of the sound space is one of extreme discord between what can be seen, the steady stream of uh, passengers moving around the central platform and the numerous sound action that were recorded. There is no coordinated uh, and overarching logic of the sound space, but rather different scales of listening that are mainly organized around the crisis, the criers, the ticket vendors announcing uh, buses. Um, in the station, um, there is no other informational system associated with these voices. There are no display boards, no timetables, nor even an information desk. There are many criers as there are destinations and just as many buses ready to depart. Uh, this is essential. The entirely acoustic character of the announcements and the numerous sound sources imply that there are many ways of perceiving and locating ticket vendors' voices. From a semantic point of view, the voice always indicates the destination and the criers contract uh, the words and the name of the city to, to, to give a kind of sound effects to the words. Uh, for instance, the, the tree shoe city name, it becomes shure, 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 kunakulam become kulam, kulam. And this uh, small prosodic effect is combined with a repetition and a melodic and tonal coloration that amplifies the phenomenon of personalization. Um, this is um, uh, also a, a, a space where uh, uh, and the, the announcements are, are not um, broadcast in a loudly or in, informally through the station at, as it is commonly used to ensure the punctuality and departures in our cities, for instance. Uh, it is not used the future tense. For instance, the train or bus will leave at such a time from, from this platform or the other. It coordinates pre-scheduled action to which travelers are invited to comply. That is the, the, a, monop a monopolistic uh, way to announce uh, the time. But in Indian bus station, on the contrary, time is present, time is immediate. Voice uh, information is transmitted when, when passengers are already on the move. Uh, it is not used to invite the passengers to move. 
and this acoustic propagation of these voices can only be heard in a limited area. There is no general broadcasting uh, system. Um, in, uh, with this call, uh, the crier uh, not only announces the departure, but he, he, he gives three types of information at the same time. The destination, the bus location, and the imminent depa departure. Um, if we consider the listener point of view, uh, usually the passenger travel habits are becoming green. Uh, everyone knows the destination and the corresponding uh, platform. Uh, the ticket vendor's uh, action uh, coincides with a very precise moment in passenger attention, the moment when passenger visually perceive the vendor in a lateral vision and acoustically distinguish his projected voice uh, from the rest, that is just before they get on the bus. Uh, behind, uh, behind station uh, criers, there is um, a dual principle of attraction and recognition. The client is literally immersed in multiple sound spheres that impel him to listen in certain way. Uh, so voices do not compete according to a monopolistic principle, but the sound space is organized into a fragmented system that is anything but random governed by the logic of multiple uh, attraction. Another important point, there is no space for lining passenger up. Um, there is a lot of information to, to give, but what, what is queuing is in, in India because uh, in, um, in very crowded spaces, it's, we can uh, think that this is an inescapable source of waiting and delay for passengers. But in fact, another logic is at work in the situation described. The continuous flow of departure and the competition between buses favors a degree of fluidity in the crowds. Uh, I have mentioned, um, the very good uh, definition of uh, the anthropologist given by the anthropologist Ajay Gandhi. Um, so you can read the, the, this definition. Um, but in this business uh, competition, uh, there is no use of lines. Uh, there is a decentralized crowd management. The absence of synchronicity and apparent discipline, to use the terms in the definition, doesn't equate with cow and confusion. The, logis I have, the logics I have identified are uh, synthesized here with the acoustic salience, the triple semantism, the multiple attraction, the sound action instant, and the principle of flows. Um, this uh, silent voices finds an echo in the visual logic of the bus. Buses, uh, the colors, motifs, uh, drawings of deities and ornaments all distinguish each vehicle and contribute to a certain visual competition. So there is a, an economy of competition. Another part, <laughs> the second phase, sorry, of the study consists of analyzing Cryer, uh, Cryer's voice using the program Sonic Visualizer. So I have analyzed uh, many voice production with the help of uh, Vincent Rioux, acoustician and computer scientist, member of the research group uh, Milson. And um, in this collaboration, we uh, attend to analyze uh, the variety of individual ways of performing the cries. Uh, taking into account the content of the returns, <coughs> the vocal technique, and the rhythm of the utterances. So in this sonogram, uh, you may see the interaction between three vendors. Uh, the main one here, 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 is announcing the tone pitchy them. The second in yellow color is um, crying the name Kunnakulam, and the third one here uh, is crying Palakad, the third name of the city. 
Uh, we can also read this anagram vertically. So we have noticed three bands from uh, 200 Hertz to 700 Hertz. Uh, this band marks the zone where spoken voice, motor noises, and all the sources of the ordinary bra of the station are found. In this second band, this is uh, the band where the performance space of vendors is, is uh, preferred. Uh, they place their voices just above the, the first zone on the spectrum. Uh, and the third band, uh, from 2,800 Hz to 3,800 Hz and above is the third zone marks the frequency uh, zone where whistle sounds I, are by far the most uh, prominent. Um, so let me play few se few seconds of uh, this example. <laughs> So we can um, notice that the, that the fundamental of the voice of the vendor one, this one that is crying pitch them, uh, is in the Brua band, the first one, while his vocal technique allows him to straighten harmonic two, that is a notice in pink color here, uh, which around 700 Hertz. If the vendor's performance, uh, the tone name is repeated uh, and the vocalization is also specific. The main vendor see, see, uses a rising frequency at the end of the phrase here, that is, uh, works on the saturation of his vocal cords in the last pitchy dum pitché. So that is really noticeable on the sonogram. So this visual representation uh, shows how uh, these additional voices coordinate, it, coordinate themselves over time, either by inserting themselves into pose, as here, or by brief superimposition here. So there are many examples to examine. Uh, I have one with seven vendors, so we, we, we try to identify each voice and to to put, uh, to attribute one color and to analyze it through sonograms. And um, this uh, acoustical works uh, show that um, sound space firstly uh, illustrate that the social interaction in this competitive setting is created by occupying different strata of sound spectrum. Uh, the examples of uh, vendors um, has to be seen as complex practices uh, of sound manipulation, where uh, the seeking of preeminence is not only operated to parameters of sound intensity. Uh, Usually we, we think that intensity will help to, to be silent in the public space, but in fact, this is the tone, the prosody, and the time structure that is efficiency in this uh, space. Uh, the acoustic events are organized at different scales while relying of, uh, on auditory acuity to serve economic ends and efficiently manage the crowd on a daily uh, basis. By comparing these public voices, it becomes clear that uh, sound creates nothing in and off itself, but it does have the potential to create action and co-action. And this is what characterizes the users 
uh, experiences. The approach is therefore um, in line with social scientists' uh, current effort to address the perception action diet to the category of affordance uh, that is initially introduced in the psychology of visual perception by James Gibson in 1979. And um, affordance of an object refers uh, to its capacity or ability to suggest a use or make a use possible as soon as the object is perceived. And speaking of uh, the affordance of sound events, not only means considering perception as um, achievements, but but furthermore, assessing how certain events do much more than simply attract our attention. They organize and affect our activities. There is um, an additional dimension, sorry, <coughs> uh, that seems to escape to the category of affordance is the self-generated nature of this uh, sound production. The sound forms are regulated in situ uh, beyond the exclusive individual intervention of each sound producer and yet, but they are not the result of the simple sum of these contributions. So that is um, a kind of collective coordination that, I did, that has been widely described uh, in many different uh, sciences, art and humanities uh, to describe this uh, auto-generated form um, and highlighting the complexity of interaction and the way to acting collectively. In other words, an, es an, essential, an essential aspect that people function uh, together. Um, let's uh, move now to the, my second uh, ethnographic study about quiet areas. This is a, a completely different fieldwork that I have uh, conducted um, during the last uh, four years. Um, I have mentioned that uh, in Indian cities, vehicle traffic is, uh, are dense, the din of horns defining, the sidewalks and pedestrian areas nearly non-existent. So one question arises: to what extent resident can avoid or adapt to the ambient noise? That, is the, that was the basic question of the study. It addresses the ordinary perception of user of a park in Trivandrum in South India. Uh, this park it was on, the, on one of the parts of the city where people say they can move around in peace. Um, I have mentioned the word shandanam. Uh, for peaceful area, the equivalent of the term calm uh, as used by the acoustician. I use two methodologies. Uh, one is a well-established practice in research uh, and the arts consisting of um, listening to and something, sometimes recording everything while moving about a place that is called the sound walks, commented walks. It invites the people to think about their sound environment, understand their relationship to the specific moment they pass through a given space and or assess the environment in relation to the urban fabric. So they, there are many ways to conduct sound walkings. Uh, in my study, I have um, thought that it was more interesting to use a predetermined itinerary. Uh, it always started at the west gate of the park. And when I was meeting uh, people at another place, uh, we were talking, walk, talking and walking together to the starting post. That was a way also to introduce to the purpose of the study and to collect personal information, age, professional activity, and so on. So the itinerary always start outside from the waste gate. I will show a map uh, later. And, and at the second exist, exit at, uh, on east. <coughs> uh, the duration of the sun walk was decided at the times. So ranging roughly from 10 to 20 minutes. Um, 
and the people were free to stop in order to look, talk, or to walk quickly. Um, and it was also determined uh, by everyday experience of people and preferred times of day uh, when it opens in the morning or at sunset in the evening. So there are many um, different interviews that have been conducted at this different uh, time of the day. Um, the contrast of uh, daily life in the park and in the area were not subject uh, to a specific analysis because uh, it is clear that perceptions are different <laughs> over the course of the day. So I have not highlighted this point. Uh, another point uh, of uh, the methodology is uh, that um, verbal exchanges were governed by similar principle, uh, principles according to a classical anthropological interview uh, method using the most open of terms, non-directive, uh, with um, Indian formants own language, that means Kerala in Malayalam and or in English, and leaving expression as open-ended as possible to give rein to the impressions uh, of the spaces they cross. In other words, um, the researchers are not the and not um, at no pre-established res response grid. So the question were, were very simple. Uh, what do you hear? Uh, what do you feel? And further speech were prompted regularly with questions, including what else do you hear? What do you mean? Very simple. <laughs> <coughs> and getting judiciously because of period of silence, because when people mute, uh, uh, this is also an integral part of the experiment to identify the silence. Uh, but mostly people were talkative uh, when they crossed boundaries in the park, passing into the compound from outside, moving nearby closed spaces, or open space along the main route or smaller paths. And uh, that is um, confirmed that uh, architectural boundaries uh, must be considered as the main gerbos of uh, speech. Uh, the second methodology used uh, is a decibel measurement provided by the open source uh, Android uh, application, a mobile phone application no, uh, called uh, No Sculpture that has been developed by French researchers from the CNRS and the Gustave Eiffel uh, University. And it allows uh, to perform uh, measurement associated with uh, geolocalization. So this map shows uh, <coughs> the general configuration of the park um, uh, with the decibel measurement. So you can see the different levels of decibels here on the right side. So we can clearly uh, note uh, that the park is surrounded by the presence of the sounds of the city directly bordered by a very circulated road. And the other part aligned with the zoo on the north side, a snack area, a small children park here, a gallery art in the north, and it includes a central pathway that is very close to the road, <coughs> and different small pathways that, that are in the inner space of the park. So the color becomes yellow because the decibel are less, because we are farthest of the main road. So, um, it helps me to understand what people say when they cross the boundaries. <laughs> so sometimes they will hear the noise nearby, sometimes they will not. So that's why that was, enduring, that was interesting to combine the two methodologies. Um, here are some photographs of the main uh, route. Um, let me uh, play a short sound example of uh, this area. Oh, 
So as compared to the bus station, we are in a very different sound uh, spaces. Um, uh, let me finishing uh, the presentation of the space configuration. Huh? Um, here are the spaces for rest and for studying. Um, another uh, in the inner space of the park, another space uh, for sitting, a meeting, discussing, uh, other uh, pathways with greeneries, uh, when people stand, uh, stop and discuss, and an area planted with uh, vegetation where people usually meet and also discuss. So in this uh, configuration, I have conducted this uh, sun walk. Uh, I forget uh, to mention that was individual sun walks. Um, um, <coughs> the um, participant uh, terrences during the sound was converge in evoking eight uh, recurring themes. Um, so I have uh, uh, presented these eight themes, but I will comment only the fourth one, the peaceful in general, and the eighth one, the restorative experience that had the that had more salient in the discourses. <coughs> a perception of uh, the parks uh, have, are verbalized at moments of transition, mainly when crossing boundaries. The first boundaries is in the entrance into the park where study participants express qualifiers such as following. So when they enter the, into the park, they say, this is quiet. This is sweet atmosphere, this is silent, this is peaceful. But as we have seen on the mat, it's just nearby the main road when the sound is very deep. Uh, usually, uh, participants often indicated sounds close to them, voices, people, birds, insects, breeze on trees during um, sound walks, but they rarely mention traffic sounds also, they were quite prominent in terms of frequency, duration, and intensity. The fact that this zone of transition is characterized as calm, sweet, peaceful, demonstrates the subjectivity, the strong subjectivity of their perception. Um, could it be due to a capacity for abstraction? of the participant, or might it be an effect of the place itself, which with an atmosphere that acts directly on the perception of people passing truth. But since people do not evoke uh, the atmosphere as inherent uh, to the place, um, they do evoke its sensorial qualities. Another model is possible for understanding this disparity. I have... Uh, analyzed uh, this subjectivity uh, by uh, studying and reading again <laughs> the anthropology work on landscape that, is, that are very useful for our purpose. <coughs> uh, these works describe it as fundamentally a process of metamorphosis, the deliberate, the deliberate transposition of an environment. Uh, Descola, the French anthropologist Descola, uh, defined this process as a transfiguration that occurs in situ uh, in the form of an arrangement of the space or in visu in the form of a scheme of perception serving as a model for this figuration. Um, this work uh, published by Descola was based on visual uh, perception and, and images or presentation of images and but it does not seem unthinkable to transpose the idea of scheme from the visual sphere to the acoustic. Um, it would it be possible to sing the sound environment undergoing through transsonorization? Uh, it is not the external form where traffic sound dominate that is transmitting in the park, but an intention to feel the calm and peacefulness. 
care is to be taken. However, to not make a complete abstraction of this environment, it is still perceptible information that people also remark upon as such. But the intention is oriented through the calm. Um, sound walker um, also indicate regularly during the sound walks uh, how the park atmosphere has a positive impact on their psychological state. Um, the park seems to be a place that contrasts greatly with the urban environment, a place where, we, where is it is possible to rest and recharge. Everyone have or most probably experienced this, um, this uh, psychology, psychological effect of going uh, passing the garden parks in the city. This is not specific to in your parks, of course. Um, I have mentioned here uh, the work uh, published by uh, acoustician uh, and the different parameters to describe uh, what is a quiet area. Uh, most of these researchers have, uh, have studied uh, and conducted sound wall in European cities and North American cities. So these are the results of, your, of their works. Uh, they mentioned uh, a, a restfulness of directed attention, a sense of harmony, a place of contrast, uh, a, a experience of feeling nature, a tuning in, uh, in on uh, inner world, a feeling of freedom uh, and space. Um, it is uh, striking that the people doing sound walks in India uh, did not express most of these elements in such a terms, with uh, the exception of the first, that is in blue color, uh, directed attention, and the third, perceived contrast, uh, specifically because they don't have the same definition of what is nature. Natural elements are never identified as such. I mean, nature as opposed to the urban with which one might reconnect or join in harmony. This is a very Western style of seeking nature and representing nature. Um, in India, uh, these um, elements uh, are rather uh, a, a kind of our environment that enables the quality of human relationships. Uh, second, the question of inner world and freedom are very individualistic notion that don't make sense in Indian society where the person is deeply rooted in his social networks, such as to be part of a family, genealogy, caste, and so on. So people, when they go through the park, they speak about their family, then, then uh, friends, and the, the memory they have together when, when they, they were using the, the park, but also in different uh, time. Um, perception <laughs> of sensory environment uh, also relates to the theory of space, spaces for mental restoration, which analyzes the benefits of natural spaces as uh, was uh, as Kaplan has described as restorative experiences. So I have reported uh, the four um, parameters uh, that are properties, sorry, uh, described by Kaplan uh, to describe this restorative uh, experience. Though so the being away, the sensation of extent, a form of soft attention called the fascination and the com compatibility. Um, <coughs> again, some of the discord samples I have collected uh, align with the criteria of being away uh, and the extent, both connecting to something else as well as soft fascination, which marks a break in the directed attention uh, that dominates the handling of daily stimuli. Uh, but the fourth one, the compatibility and supposed harmony um, with nature is only slightly relevant to defining the park sound environment because 
uh, nature is not perceived and included as such, but rather as part of a setting for uh, experiencing the everyday social uh, relations. Um, the, this uh, ethnographic study of the sound perception in park and the experiments I have, uh, the experiments I have conducted with people locally uh, has made it possible to demonstrate that uh, what is we called peaceful is not exactly a given, is not measured by the decibel, <laughs> uh, but rather it is the object of a process of transsonorization coming from people whose relationship to the place is invested with sensoriality and intention as well. A continuum also seems to emerge between a perception of peacefulness and a degree of uh, mental uh, restoration. Um, the main uh, definition uh, of what is a quiet play area, a restorative uh, quiet area have been stated in uh, European and North American cities. Accordingly, the methodologies proven in uh, urban settings, such as sun walks, commented walks, uh, reactivity, glazing, and so on. There are many um, uh, qualitative methods to use, uh, but it, they are only rarely been tried and tested in the global south. This leads to an important observation, a large part of the world in all its cultural diversity remains to be studied with in situ uh, methods. And I hope that is uh, will pro also provide an expanded empirical base uh, for defining uh, invariant or universal categories, such as quiet areas or restorative uh, experience. So here are some of the references I have um, mentioned during the second um, study in the park. And I suggest to close uh, the conference and open for the discussion and I thank you very much for your uh, attention. Mm -hmm.